Good morning and welcome to La Mesa Presbyterian Church on this fourth Sunday of Lent. My name is Marty Bruner. And as we come together this morning for worship, I am joined by the Reverend Steve Miller, our very talented videographer, Denia Nepoli, our guest musicians for the day, Marlis Leslie and Donise Mayfield. And we are so happy to have back our music director, Leon Lake, with us today. It is time now for the passing of the peace, COVID style. Take a few minutes, if you would, to call or text or email someone near or far, set up a time to talk with them later in the day or at a convenient time, then rejoin us in the prelude. Friends, the peace of Christ be with us all. And also in continue to worship in our virtual world, separated by distance, but joined in spirit and as a community in faith, let us respond to this call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Let us thank the Lord for God's steadfast love for God's wonderful works to humankind. Let us offer thanksgiving sacrifices. Let us tell of God's deeds with songs of joy.
As we come to worship, let's be aware of our needs for God's grace. Pray with me the prayer of confession. God of love, give us the courage to examine our lives and confess the ways we separate ourselves from you. We have divided loyalties. In this Lenten season, as we see the cross before us, we are tempted to avoid the cost of discipleship. We would rather move straight on to Easter. Help us through your grace to see the rewards of sacrificial love and to clear our priorities so that we may serve you and love one another more joyfully. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hear the good news. God's grace is ever abundant, and we are assured that every moment offers a fresh start. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Spirit, tell us what we need to hear and show us what we ought to do to obey Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The first lesson is from Numbers 21, verses 4 through 9. Listen for the word of the Lord. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go round the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. This people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food, no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people. They built, bit the people so that many Israelites died the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, make a poisonous serpent, set it on a pole. Everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze, put it upon a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The gospel lesson this morning is from the gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that God gave God's only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For those who do evil 
hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A father asked his son to do a trust, trust exercise. So the father said, son, just fall back into my arms and I'll catch you. And so the son fell back and the father caught him. And the father said, okay, now I'm going to step back just a little further and catch, me, catch you. So just trust me. So the son fell back and the father stepped out of the way. The son fell to the floor and cried. And the father said, that's an important lesson. Never trust anyone. No wonder the Hebrews didn't trust Moses and Yahweh in the wilderness. No wonder the early followers of Jesus often lost faith. No wonder in the suffering in the world, even among us and within us, as this suffering continues, it's hard to keep on trusting God to guide us. For some of us, trust is harder than for others. Both our Hebrew scripture and our gospel reading this morning deal with people having to learn to trust against all odds. I think the boy whose father let him fall could learn to trust again, but it would require decisions on his part and life experiences that connect him to the resurrection experiences of the followers of Jesus. Even so, we can make decisions to fall into the everlasting arms, and when we do, we find those arms will not let us fall. The love at the heart of the universe is trustworthy, even when trusting is scary. Do you trust snakes? Do you like snakes? Are you an ophidiophiliac, someone who is a snakeophile, someone who loves snakes. There are people like that. Snakes have a lot of positive attributes. Matthew says, be wise as serpents. So snakes are revered in some cultures, but overall in the Bible, they get a bad rap. It seems they have just this one little unpopular feature. Some of them kill people. So in the desert, you don't want a snake in your tent. If you wander in the desert for generations escaping slavery in Egypt, you get a little impatient with the serpents and with your leader who doesn't seem to know the way to the promised land. Thus, the Bible generally uses snakes as symbols of evil and of temptation. The book of Numbers <clears throat> comes to us from a time much later than the time in which it's written. It describes the story of the Hebrews in the, exi in, in the Exodus told from the perspective of the exile. When the Hebrews are in exile in Babylon and longing to return to the time of their glory. So in telling that they are impatient for the promised land in Exodus and impatient to return to their glory in exile, aren't all times times of impatience? We are eager to get to better days. The people had become tired of wandering and we are tired of pandemic restrictions. So they did the equivalent of taking off their masks and gathering together. They grumbled against Yahweh and Moses. It's a recurrent theme in the story of the Exodus. People become weary when we don't get instant gratification. This congregation, the time between settled pastors can be a time of impatience. It can even seem like a long process. I celebrate that this congregation moves forward on the journey in trust and confidence. The transition between the Hebrews' time in the wilderness may seem to take a long time, but beware of shortcuts. I was trying to lead a group of teenagers on a hike through the forest, and we were going down those switchback trails where you can see the trail below you, and yet you know you're supposed to stay on the path, but they could see all kinds of shortcuts that would be possible if they would just sort of go down from one to the other. And so one of them egged the others on and said, just do it. 
And so they, a few of them just sort of slid down from one path to the other. And in doing that, they ripped up their pants, they tore out a bunch of brush, they caused a minor landslide which blocked the path below. And it was a really hard day. Okay, I made that up, but you get the point. Shortcuts sometimes are not a good idea. The long way is sometimes the right way. Sticking with pan pandemic restrictions is just another example, and we all know that, and yet sometimes it's hard to be patient. You might get away with a shortcut, but staying on the trail is best for everyone. How did the story of the Hebrews in the wilderness help the people through all of their efforts to serve Yahweh century after century? How did this story, when they paid attention to it, bring them back to faithfulness? How can it help us? What kind of vaccination can we get from the serpent of discontent? The story of the bronze serpent calls us to faithfulness. It calls us to persevere when the future looks dim. It calls us to loyalty. So John connects that story to the Jesus story in which Jesus say, says, and just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Just as we hear the story of the Hebrews in the wilderness from the perspective of the storyteller, we need context to have a clue about what the gospel according to John is trying to tell us. Many historical Jesus scholars don't like the Gospel of John because it tells the story very differently from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But I like John. It's poetry. It portrays Christ more as the cosmic Christ than as the historical Jesus. So it gives us a whole different perspective than the, what they call the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so as John tells us this story, it's also the last one to be, that was written that's included in the New Testament. So it gives us also the picture of the early Christians struggling with the Roman Empire and how to deal with that. The Roman Empire at the time celebrated freedom of religion. People could worship as many gods and goddesses as they wished as long as Caesar and the empire came first. Caesar was a symbol of loyalty to the empire. Caesar was called the son of God. The early Christians had the faith that said Jesus is Lord. And that was an explicit contradiction to Caesar is Lord. Where do you place your loyalty? The Jews were already in trouble for having Yahweh above all gods. Of course, a few Jews, not all of them, but a few Jews, um, sort of figured we just have to get by. And so they made compromises. They yielded to the culture. They made friends in high places and played along with the system. They were co-opted by the empire. Then this radical bunch of Jesus followers comes along even more directly challenging the empire. These Jesus followers weren't in competition with any religion of the empire except Caesar worship, nationalism. True patriotism, I think, is not nationalism. We can have separation of church and state and call our nation to give loyalty to the love and the justice that we affirm rather than claiming that God is loyal to us. A couple of words in the scripture need exploring. One is darkness. See, I like darkness. I like a moonlit night. Without darkness, you can't see the stars. Sleep experts say that we need more darkness to sleep better. Today, we have too many lights in our bedrooms. Our brains need darkness. Darkness is good but not in John's gospel. Darkness means, in John, danger and evil. Darkness is the dark alley in which you might get mugged. Darkness means you can't see to find your way. So, like serpents in the book of Numbers, darkness was evil. Do you have slaves? I can't see who's raising their hands, except so I can't tell who's really lying, but you know, if 
If you have a computer or a cell phone or most of the clothes that we wear, if you have a refrigerator, you have slaves. You mean you just soon not know about it, you'd rather stay in the dark? Oh, is that what John means when he says the people loved darkness? We don't really want to know about the labor practices of people who create the things that we can get as cheap as possible. Because if we did, we might have to change our purchasing policies. Darkness is sometimes very convenient. And yet, when we call ourselves into the light, when we hear Jesus calling us into the light, then we can move on and maybe begin to do something about those things. So darkness can still be pretty evil. Even more confusing is the word believe. So the Greek word for believe could often better be translated as trust. We often think of it as think. And so we get those things mixed up. And it's a very common word in the Gospel of John. It's used 99 times in John, whereas in the other Gospels it's 9 or 10 each. So think is better translated in John as trust. Everyone believes in something, I believe I'll have another cookie. I actually believe in my friends. I believe in my wife, I believe in my pension fund. I believe in you, I believe in La Mesa Presbyterian Church. Trust, though, is hard. Sometimes, I mean, I think I believe in myself, and yet sometimes I say, come on, Steve, just fall and let it happen. And then I get out of my way and I fall on my uh, floor, and then I say, it's hard to trust. It's hard to trust myself. It's hard to trust anybody. And yet, I'm called to trust in God, even when it seems really hard. You see, to believe is not a creed, it's a relationship. It's hard to trust in Jesus when he says, the cross of sacrificial love is the way to life. It's hard, it was hard for Martin Luther King Jr. when the dogs were snapping at his heels and attacking and his family was threatened. So many of the saints of all time had to stand up for their integrity, for living in the image of God, for acting out the love they've been given. It's hard to believe in love. Today, people are dying in Myanmar rather than yielding to the military coup. Seems to me they are walking in the light. What are we called to sacrifice during this Lenten season to bring the love of God to the world that God still loves? So today's scriptures suggested to me again um, some lyrics and a tune that um, You can vaccinate from COVID You can vaccinate from measles Many vaccines around Also get a shot of God's love And learn to love like Jesus For you know you always stand on solid ground The Hebrews in the wilderness Beset by poisonous snakes Moses to the rescue to Do whatever it takes Serpent in the darkness Back. 
vaccines around. Also get a shot of God's love and learn to love like Jesus. For you know you always stand on solid ground. When all of life seems like one long lint of sacrifice and struggle, can you trust that the vaccine of God's love will carry you through to the Easter's of life? What is the serpent in your wilderness? When is your love tested? When is it hard to trust in God? To trust in God is to trust that love wins. It's to trust, whether you think it or not, that Jesus was not defeated by the cross. It's to trust that Martin Luther King Jr. did not lose to the assassin's bullet. It's to trust that your loving actions through La Mesa Presbyterian Church and through your daily life, whether you see results or not, are Easter proclamations, even when life seems like the wilderness of Lent. Thank you, God, for your promise and for our ability to trust in you and to be received into your arms. Amen. Intimate mystery of our lives, too great for our mortal brains to comprehend and yet too wondrous for our hearts to ignore. We turn our attention to you in praise. As our senses are awakened to new life arising in daffodils and singing birds, awaken also our spirits to feel your presence everywhere. In moments of silence and even in isolation and loneliness, remind us of your presence within us. Thank you, loving God, for all the blessings of life, even for life itself. Thank you for opportunities to share and to thus celebrate the bounty of your love. Keep us mindful of the bounty so that we may live in the joy of your creation. Blessed as we are, we continue in gratitude for ask, to ask for your intercession in our lives, in the lives of our loved ones, and in the events of the world. Prayers for our loved ones today include the family of, and friends, including this congregation of Sue Callahan, who died recently after a long illness and a good life. 
Lord, hear our prayer. For Joan Luke and continuing illness, Lord, hear our prayer. For Bob Roby, Lord, hear our prayer. For caregivers and their loved ones with diseases like multiple sclerosis and cancer, for those people who struggle with those and other maladies, Lord, hear our prayer. For our planet, as she struggles to overcome the damage done by our species, Lord, hear our prayer. For peoples of the world struggling to be free, sometimes against all odds, Lord, hear our prayer. For our own country, as polarized politics and cultural differences in this time of rapid changes put stresses on people, families, and friendships, Lord, hear our prayer. And now we pause in silence to offer all our prayers, spoken and unspoken, and to hear your prayers to us. Lord, hear our prayers. We are your people, and even as we are still learning to trust you, we dedicate our efforts to you, and we rely on your grace to sustain us. Thus we pray, as Jesus taught us, our Father and Mother in heaven, may your name be kept holy, may your realm come on, and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for the ultimate realm and the power and the glory are yours forever. Amen. La Mesa Presbyterian Church is an offering to God, the neighborhood, and the world. Worship itself is an offering. When you write a check to the church, when you give online, or find other ways to support God's work through the church, it is an act of worship. You may do this now or at any time. When you make your offering, ask God's blessing and be aware of the joy of giving. We always have some announcements that need to be made. The top one today for me is the food pantry. It remains busy as usual. We appreciate each of your contributions. They keep the operation running and our community fed. We appreciate those who work each day in the food pantry, for those who work weekly, and for those who need the help and the food. Going deeper will be at nine o'clock on Sunday. Holy Happy Hour continues and at seven o'clock on Sunday evenings. Winona usually sends out the questions ahead of time to spark conversation 
and reflection. Women's Bible study will be this Tuesday, March 16th at 11 a.m. Join us as we continue our study in the Horizon study entitled Into the Light. We will discuss lesson seven entitled Creation Laments. Remember, you may RSVP on our web website for these and all future uh, events. Now, Bob Roby has a presentation he'd like to make to Mike Hubert. Bob, let's take it away. Uh, good morning, my name is Bob Roby, and I'm here with Mike Hubert to uh, honor Mike for decades of service to the church. So on behalf of the Mesa Presbyterian Church, we recognize the creative gifts of Mike Hubert that guided his careful execution of fine woodworking projects around the church facility. The statue of Joseph, the carpenter woodworker, is shown here to represent the extent the wood has worked from select rough-hewn lumber milled down for use into fine woodwork, typical of Mike's process. May Joseph continue to look over all your days and remind those that follow of your generosity and talent, Mike. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I can't say for him. I love this church. That's why I do the work. This is Joseph. These are pictures of the different elements of woodworking that Mike's done around. And that is the baptismal font and the the fountain, Christ counter Christ holder, counter holder. The, uh, holder the holder of the fountain, the uh, sconces, uh, sconces. <clears throat> and half of this organ wall here is hanging across and then uh, adding to the columbarium. Too many people were dying, so they had to add <laughs> to that. <laughs> And then all the stuff in the choir room and, and the choir library showing me yeah. and the vestry and the handles on the handles on the outside, outside doors. doors. And I can't think of what well, railing out here. Right. But, uh, it's and been fun. You helped with the pews? Yep. The tall guy out there helped with the tall the guy. That's the Joel. Yeah, that's Joel. But uh, we did all the little pads on the bottom of the pews, so. Anyway, we thank you. Well, I, I appreciate it. So I thought I'd do something that maybe your grandchildren can look at later. Yeah, they may fight over it, but. <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot. And thanks, thanks to the church. Good.
benediction with the Franciscan blessing. May God bless us with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that we will live deeply and from the heart. May God bless us with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that we will work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless us with tears to shed for those who mourn so that we will reach out our hands to them and turn our mourning into joy. And may God bless us with just enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in this old world so that we will do those things that others say cannot be done. Amen. Thank you.